you do not understand a lick about reloading, but you want to, you're in good company. Yes, me naturally as the one who also doesn't know anything about it. But most importantly, we have Brady Miller who has been reloading for a decade. Brady works at Go Hunt and his dad got him into this a long time ago. And over the years, the guy has become a complete reloading nerd. He loves this stuff. Also, I promised his wife we would not tell her just how much he loves this stuff because he kind of spends a lot of money on gear. <laughs> so keep the show to yourself and hopefully she doesn't follow us. Today, Brady tells all, including how to reload safely, what supplies you need to get started, how to clean and prep before reloading, what are dyes and how to use them, do you reload for quality, to save money or both, and we're going to find out about Brady's favorite piece of reloading gear, which again is the part you can't tell his wife. Also, before we start the show, I wanted to remind you that Gearbox Talk is brought to you by Go Wild, as in the company I co-founded. As of today, if you create an account on Go Wild, we're going to give you $10 for free to spend on gear. As you use Go Wild, you continue to unlock not only discounts and gift cards, but free swag. It's awesome. This is a new feature, so if you've been there before, you want to make sure you log in and get those free rewards that you've unlocked. Otherwise, create a free account, you get 10 bucks. Visit DownloadGoWild.com or check your app store to get this free app. All right, back to reloading. This is Gearbox Talk with Brady Miller. Get ready for showtime, for showtime. Brady Miller, how's it going, man? Oh, it's good. I am glad to be talking about things I love, so it's going to be fun. Oh, dude, and I told you this before, I'm always glad to be talking about things I don't know anything about. So I, I'm literally like, if I sound like I have no idea what I'm asking about, it's because I don't. My team's kind of helped me figure out the questions that a newbie reloader should ask and what they should get to know. So you're going to help educate me and our audience here today. You ready? Yeah, you're going to buy a bunch of reloading stuff afterwards, I think. I know. I'm, I'm, I might. <laughs> we'll have uh, links to the gear in the show notes. So if you want to buy like me, you can join us there. All right, man, before we talk ammo, and usually before I talk firearms, I always like to go through the safety route first. So, you know, for folks who like me who know absolutely nothing about this, can you explain, like, let's hit a few of the safety precautions uh, that you should consider before you give reloading a go. So, yeah, basically everything we do in reloading, you're working with like quote unquote bombs, you know, you're reloading things that are explosives. So the biggest thing is always like, no matter what you're doing, have a process. And I always like to have a, like a notepad right next to me, write down what I'm doing, exact, exact step-by-step -step process throughout the whole thing. So I know everything dive into even like, you know, reloading manuals, you know, like what powder is going to work with your exact gun. Like you don't want to throw just random powders in there because you could just lead to something disastrous. The other thing, big thing too is like, since we are working with explosives, like you have to be in a clean environment. Like I do everything in this little room right here. This is only my reloading slash hunting room. I don't, you know, do anything else in here. I don't eat food, don't do any of that stuff. And then like, if you are someone who smokes, obviously you should come out with, you know, you should not be smoking while dealing with powders, while dealing with primers, anything that can explode. This is not a good idea. And also the biggest thing too, is like, you might have several different guns that take several different powders. Like you're going to want to keep Whatever you're working on that day, let's say I'm working on my 300 wind mag that uses Hodgen H1000 powder. I only want that one powder on my bench at one time. That way I don't accidentally leave the room, come back in, and I have muzzleloader powder sitting over here. Grab that muzzleloader powder, thought the same thing because it's in a little tray, dump it in there, and my gun blows up. Or I shoot my muzzleloader and actually have rifle like powder in it. Like, so it's just like any little thing you can think of, like, hey, I need to be fully zoned in. I need to, you know. Just watch everything I'm doing because this is it's very easy to do, but it's also easy to mess up if you're not, you know, taking little precautions here or there. So just make sure you have everything written down, every powder for that gun only on their table at one side at one time, and just zone in on that gun. Probably I don't know if anybody's ever told you this analogy, but it reminds me a lot of beer brewing. I used to brew beer back in the day uh, before I found out I was allergic to beer. Uh, oh, <laughs> but shoot. The, I know, right? That's so fun. Yeah, I know, right? But the you know, it's you had to be super clean. You had to make sure all all your ingredients are separated until it's the right time to come together. You, you know, you don't want to put the IPA wheat and the stout or whatever. You know, the recipes are the recipes are the recipes for a reason. And mm -hmm. so I hadn't really thought about like you really got to be super organized and super clean when, when you're doing this and like maintaining a really good workstation. Yep. Another thing too, it's like, uh, you just mentioned drinking too. Like, yeah, you know, we all like to have a little adult beverage sometimes, but like probably not <laughs> something you want to be doing when you're reloading, especially when your reloading process goes all the further. You've had a few of those, like just keep the right mindset, keep everything yeah. good. 
Another big thing too about reloading is, you know, there's so much information on the internet. Like you could Google right now, like, hey, I, I have a 300 win mag. What is the load recipe I should be shooting? So someone could say like, hey, for me, I shoot 300 win mag, H1000 powder, 77.1 grains of powder with a certain primer, certain brass, certain bullet. Yeah, that works great for my gun, but most, most of the time it is not going to work for your gun. And so if you had that same sort of gun, same exact setup, and you try to do the exact same thing, your gun might not like that. You're going to have huge pressure signs. So like no matter what people say on the internet, like, hey, this works really well, it might work really well, but just make sure you're uh, going to start your load process a little bit lower on those grains of powder and, don't, and then work your way up to that person's pet load because that just adds to disaster. Is there kind of like a, a reload Bible that people start with? Is there a guidance here or do you have any websites to recommend for people to kind of ease into this stuff in like one condensed place? Yeah. I mean, uh, for most of the time, like there's what I got right here. I got this guy. There's like a bunch of like reloading like manuals. So every like bullet manufacturer, powder manufacturers, all of these manuals and inside these manuals are just like, like right here, 243 grain, like what kind of powder you should start at, what you work up to, what's going to be the max load. And then also there's like a bunch of stuff in the beginning of these books about how to reload, uh, all the steps to kind of go through it. So these are like reloading Bibles in a way. Like YouTube is a great place to yeah. start, but you gotta always remember there is junk on the internet. Yeah. And so just take everything with a grain of salt and also just try to like consult someone or even go into the range and like, and reloading, like, you know, there's, there's mentors out there. There's also reloading classes you can take. There's a bunch of them that kind of like travel around different areas. I know there's a lot of them in the West area. Um, but there's reloading classes. And so what you're going to be doing, because like I said, these are explosives and you want to have good data to start with and not some guy on the internet says this works really well. You should always start low if you're working on powder and work up to his max low because things can go, things can go wrong in a hurry. Right. Right. I was going to mention like the thing you, you, you talked about, there's a lot of information online and a lot of times you end up on forums and you'll find competing ideas on anything, right? You know, whether it's, yep. you can, you can argue like compound crossbow or, or all the way into this stuff till the day you die. Right. Um, so there, there is a lot of information out there. There's a lot of stuff to consider when it comes to researching something, like you said, that's an explosive, um, you know, I I've seen some reloading supplies online and you'll see it in sporting goods stores. But the supply chain has been so out of whack that I feel like this this answer may have changed from where what it would have been eighteen months ago. So I'm I'm very curious to get your uh, your advice for somebody that's getting started. Like, where do you even start to find the tools to find the supplies for reloading? The biggest thing now is trying to find primers, trying to find powder, and trying to find bullets. It's it happens. You know, it's cyclical. Like it always things get really hard to find. People start stocking, hoarding everything. So like right now, it is probably the hardest time to jump into reloading because <laughs> there's so many people out there that are hoarders, you know, and just like, like the other day I was trying to, uh, I was driving up to go to a, a seminar in, in Montana, got a notification on my phone that, hey, this is available. I quickly went on there, added to my cart, tried to check out and then boom, it was gone before yeah. I even got to check out. So like the biggest thing right now to me is having notifications on every single website or store. Like if you want to buy powder or you want looking for primers or looking for even like reloading dyes. Like there's a lot of things right now you just can't get because everyone wants to get out there and shoot. Everyone wants to get out there and try hunting. So it's like becoming really, really popular. So you have to get notifications on. And also just found like this random uh, app on my phone. I think like people who are in like the gaming community or stuff like that use it. Discord. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of it before until I saw someone yeah. pop up on the reloading forum. So there's actually like a reloading section on discord where people can like post notifications like, Hey, there's powder available or Hey, there is a bullet available here. And you have to be fast on it too, because they've already probably bought yeah, they've got their theirs. staff <laughs> before they announced it, but at least it's a good starting point. And I do go to local, uh, you know, like sportsman's warehouse, little sh small shops like that every now and then to try to like get components for this but they're always gone. It's such a hard time to like try to find things, especially if you have like some like, you know, boutique caliber, that's really rare or something like that. But if you shoot some of the standard stuff, seven MM, six, five Creedmoors, there is stuff that keeps popping up every now and then. You just got to be, you know, Johnny on the spot and have a connection or call up a guy, make friends with them at the sporting goods store. But like, Hey, if you get any powder in, call me, I'm <laughs> yeah. your guy. Yeah. Shoot you well. So it, yeah, it's a very, very hard time to try to find components, but like, even like, there's a lot of good stuff too, like on reloading forums, like there's a longrangeonly.com, there's longrangehunting.com. And there's a lot of guys who are willing to trade products for other products. So they might have a bunch of bullets that you need and they're looking for some powder. Uh, like they're yeah. willing to swap and stuff like that. Like people are out there helping each other. 
Um, so you just got to like, you know, be in there, get, be friendly with people and try to get things. And, and they also post a lot of stuff for sale too. So you're looking to start out and you need like a, a, a press and there's no presses available. You go to midway.com, middleusa.com. There's no presses. Like there is ways you can probably get stuff through other people who are selling things. Yeah. The, we have a reloading trail on Go Wild, which is a forum. And I, I've noticed people selling stuff like presses, I think. I haven't seen as much of like primers and I, I don't pay attention to it as much because I don't mm-hmm. do this. But um, yeah, you're right. Like I, I have seen, I, th- I feel like I have seen more of that over the last year than maybe before because people are in that position of of trying to kind of make some deals. <laughs> yeah. One, one of my friends who I shoot with a lot and help him reload, he actually just drove... Like it was last month, he drove three hours one way just to pick up a bunch of primers. Wow. Yeah, it's, man, I believe it's, it. It's that crazy right now. Like you just yeah. can't get components. Yeah, we were at... Uh, this is a fun side story, but I was at an auction for a nonprofit last week and they were auctioning off a bunch of uh, 223 and uh, I was like, whatever, I'll buy it. Like, I, It's like, I, I didn't get a terrible deal on it. And I'm like, I can probably make money at, on it even at this point because there's, there's this ammo is just so crazy right now and reloading... I got to imagine that reloading boomed when ammo did because people are like, well, I can't find it anywhere else. I might as well make it. But now you're hitting the same, same, uh, hold up. I'm, and the ammo manufacturers are hitting a lot of the same uh, yep. supplies problems too. Yep. And I think too, it's hard for reloaders because a lot of that supply chain in ammo, like everyone's going to all these companies are making factory loaded ammunition. So they're not, you know, taking these little primers and just selling primers on the side. They're using those primers to make the factory ammunition. So it's like, yeah, that's, that's more of what I was trying to say. Like it, it, they need the same supplies. <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah. So they're, they probably make more money selling a fully, you know, loaded cartridge rather than little components here or there. So it makes sense for them. Well, and that's a bigger but, market that they're trying to keep with them instead of going to a competitor too. So it's uh exactly. it's kind of cutthroat right now. So yep. Hey man, we'll, we'll jump into some of the gear you have. Let's, let's talk about the press. Let's talk about first what it is and, and uh, which press you're using. Okay, so I'm just gonna slide my computer a little bit over. So over here is my reloading press. I wish I could take it off the table, but it's mounted securely. <laughs> uh, everything over here is like on my reloading bench. I like specifically built this bench just for reloading, made it sure it's very, very heavy. All my friends who helped me carry it up here because it's upstairs in my house, <laughs> probably hate me for it. But so this is a Redding uh, uh, Big Boss 2 press. So this is what they call a single stage press. So basically anytime I pull the, the lever down, the arm is going to come up into a die, which my dies are sitting over here. So I've got a reloading die. Um, it goes on top. It could be anything from a seating die, or I have a uh, full length resizing die, or also I have a uh, bullet seating die. So I have a next seat. I should start over next seating die, a bullet seating die, and a full length resizing die. So all dies are sort of different in what um, function they function they do. And so this is a single stage press. So like I said, every time I pull the handle down, I can only do one piece of ammo at a time. They also have presses that are called uh, progressive reloading presses. So every time you pull the handle down, it might, you know, size the brass a little bit. And the next step is going to go into dump some powder into it and then seat the bullet. And so like every time you do it, it makes things a lot faster. But to me, I only reload for precision. So I'm a hunter. I'm a hunter first. Everything I reload is for precision ammo. So I like this style because I can just reload my ammo in batches. After I clean my ammo, I know the next step is going to be resizing my brass. So I'll put my resizing die on and then, re- then do everything, resize all my one, all my pieces of brass and get all those done before I move to the next step. And this makes me a little bit more consistent throughout the whole thing. So there's tons of different presses out there. This press just works really well for me. I only use it for, um, obviously, there's different things you could do to reload. You need a million different dies for every sort of different cartridge you have. So it's getting really confusing probably. But just the presses... You know, the function that helps me resize, helps you deprime all the spent primers, and then, you know, eventually size it, uh, neck, neck ten- adjust your neck tension so your bullet will be seated in there and actually held in the right place with the right tension, and then also seating your bullet on top of it. So a press does a lot, but they're not very expensive. Once you have a press, like this press will probably, I actually got this from my dad's friend who passed away, and he's been using it for maybe 15, 20 years before that. So I press once and then you're pretty much good for a long, long time. Yeah. So it's a good investment. So, um, you know, when we always look at like, what are people looking for is related to this topic. And, and one thing we notice is, is the question around like, is there a cleaning and prepping process you need to do on the front end before you kind of dive into using your press and your dies? Can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah. So basically there's two, two ways I deal with brass. I deal with virgin brass, virgin brass, which is just 
fresh brass, never been shot before. So that process is just basically, I take the, I take the brass, I start inspecting everything to make sure there's no cracks, no dents in the neck. Like I always take this random piece of brass, brass right here. So basically I would just look at the neck, make sure everything's not dented, inspect it, make sure everything looks fine on it. And then say, okay, this is good. And then start inspecting my whole lot of brass first. Then I take a um, little tool here. This is just a flash hole deburr. And this basically would go inside here. And basically cleaning out the flash hole that's in the back. So I want to make sure that's uniform because a lot of these stuff are stamped in the back. And so you're going to have a little like flange uh, at the bottom. And that's when your primer ignites. It goes in there and I want that hole just to be really consistent before it you know, goes in the powder, makes the explosion, and the bullet goes out. So I use a flash hole deburr. And then I also take, actually, I should grab a different piece of ammo here. So I basically take this as a, uh, a primer pocket um, cleaner and uniformer. So I go in here and just scrape out the back of it. So that's going to clean out everything. Um, it's, it's new brass, so it doesn't really need to be clean, but it's also going to uni uniform it and make sure it's completely square because I'm just trying to remove any inconsistencies. Everything I do here is just make things more consistent and making ammo clones of each other throughout the whole process. So once I get through there, then I take it on a trimmer and I lightly uh, trim the brass. When I say, say I'm trimming the brass, I'm really not trimming it to like, you know, I'm not taking this neck and like making this really far down. I'm just basically trimming this to make it square. Hmm. Because again, if I have everything square and the bullet seats in there, then that same pressure neck tension around the bullet is going to be consistent. So I'm squaring it. And then I move into chamfering and deburring, which is a little tool right here. It's a little chamfer and deburr tool. So we have a chamfer on this side and this deburrs it. So basically I take this, put it in here and you just give it a couple twists and that's going to make the inside just a little bit smooth. So the bullet seats in there nicely. And then you take this tool, flip it around and you deburr it. Then I would uh, pretty much load this one because this is going to be a, a virgin piece of brass. I would go and prime it, um, put the powder in there, seat the bullet, and I'm good to go. But the process then for once fire brass, so let's say I get a bunch of brass back that's dirty, you know, it has a bunch of powder on the outside. Maybe I shot it, it fell in the dirt. So that whole process is going to be different because I want to make sure I clean that brass before I put it in my rifle. So I still go that same step. I'll still square, I'll still remove the primer because now it has primers in it. Then I'll go through squaring it, um, that sort of stuff. But then I take it into what is a stainless steel media drum with those stainless steel, like little BBs or pellets inside there. And that's basically you put a bunch of water in there, put a bunch of soap, and you're cleaning your brass. And this is gonna clean it really like very, very clean. So this is like some people use like corn cob media. This is just another way to clean it really, really, really well. So it basically comes out like it's brand new brass from the factory it looks all shiny everything's mm -hmm. all perfect but then the only thing you have to watch out for because all those little stainless steel pins are in there you actually have to like shake your uh case off in the water to make sure there's no you know stuck little pins in the back of your primer because you know that eventually too could lead to something dangerous down the road and make some explosion so then to throughout the whole pro oh just air drying after that i assume yep. right because there's not any way to speed that up without risking water being in there Yep, you actually could take a uh, like a dehydrator, like a food dehydrator, oh, okay. and you could put them in there at I don't know what the temperature is, 150, right. 100 some degrees, and just see at the process a little bit. But I used to take like you know some beach towels or whatever, roll my brass around, let it sit open, and let it sit there for probably at least twenty four hours because yeah. you don't want water. Yeah, <laughs> obviously it should come with no surprise. You don't want water in there when you reload later. So just make sure everything is perfectly, perfectly uh, uh, clean there. So that's like the first step of cleaning. And then there's other process I do, which I, I anneal brass, which is basically every time you are working with brass and you're shooting it, and then I am resizing the neck to make that bullet fit tighter on there, or I might be expanding it or doing whatever I'm doing to the brass, it's work hardening it. So your brass is getting more and more brittle every time you shoot it. And I could take a piece of brass and I could probably shoot it eight, 10 times, but maybe on that fourth time, if I wasn't doing this annealing process, it's going to, my brass is getting weak and getting very brittle. So what annealing does, it basically, it's this little crazy machine that's probably going to be hard to see. It's this big little guy over here. I basically stick a piece of brass in there. It heats it up to a certain temperature and then basically softens the front side of the brass. So it makes a big like annealing mark, it's called on the side of the brass. And it's a very, very complicated process. Most people probably don't need to do this, but it also just adds in consistency later on because it makes sure all my brass is the same and it gets more longevity and just adds better neck tension on my brass. So there's a lot of just yeah, it's a, like a lot more cleaning than what I thought was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I've seen yeah. the drums, but there, there yep. was a lot more steps in there than, than kind of what I had realized. And also yeah, so, thought about it, like kind of being in the middle of the process too. Like there's yeah, a little so bit of work this, on the front end and the back end. So this is the, the drum back here for the stainless steel media and all the little pins are stuck inside here. It'd be mm -hmm. a mess if I tried to grab it, but yeah, no, no worries. It, yeah. And then after all that, so I go through another process of, you know, trimming my brass again, and then I have to, you know, put some wax on the outside of my brass. Like I'm starting to, you know, size the necks and stuff like that. So then I'm going to have gunk on the outside of my brass. My brass were clean. And now through this process, I've added some wax on there because I have to make sure I had wax when I put the dies on. Otherwise your cartridge will get stuck. Your piece of brass could get stuck in the die when you use the reloading press. So then after all that, before I actually like want to dump powder in there, I need to clean off all this these solvents or wax or I also have a dry neck lube. It's basically like a little graphite powder to help you seat the bullets on there. You got to clean all that off. So I'll put that in a, another tumbler with corn cob media. And that's probably the traditional way people clean brass is just dump all your brass in the corn cob media, leave it for a couple hours and it'll get your brass also clean and work off all that wax, all that. Maybe I have some, you know, brass trimmings when I trim my brass, I want to kind of remove that. So I use a corn cob cleaner. Way more than I knew. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to something we talked about earlier. And again, I, I don't, this is all new to me. So with the, with the dies, you kind of ran through those a little bit earlier, but is there, yeah. is there more you'd like to expand on like uh, for a newbie? Um, you know, are there, are there any, like the process of using them? Uh, you kind of mentioned the press for a second, yeah. but I mean, it might be good to expand on that a little bit for the newbies. Yep. So I'm going to grab a couple of my dies here. This is my, this is actually my neck tension die. So the process I'm going to do is, I believe it's, yeah. So after I've gone through, I just mentioned I kneel my brass, just making it you know, more consistent and add some longevity to it. Then I'm going to neck size my brass. So I'm going to attach this to the press. And what this is going to do is, so after the bullet goes through the, the, the piece of brass, it obviously expands that neck a little bit. So you can basically take a bullet and set it back in your, in your cartridge and it would drop all the way to the bottom because that neck tension, because obviously when you, mm -hmm. everything blew out, that brass had to expand to allow that bullet to shoot out. So now we need to take the neck and crimp it back down to spec. So it will seat that bullet when I push it down in there and it'll hold that bullet and you won't be able to take your, you know, load it around, tip it over and everything falls out. Mm -hmm. So this is a neck seating die. And what that's going to do is <coughs> just crimp that neck down to, so you have like two thousandths or maybe even three thousandths of neck tension. And this is all stuff you can like find in a reloading book very easily. Like you want, you don't want too much neck tension because obviously then the bullet can't, you know, shoot out. It's going to be less consistent, but you also don't want um, not enough neck tension where that, again, that bullet, like you're hunting and you might bump up against something and that bullet hits something and then shoves it in and you lose much accuracy. So this, this um, die right here just does uh, neck sizing it actually has little bushings inside here that you can adjust to figure out how much neck tension you want. Then on top of here's a little micrometer and I could basically adjust it for how far down I want to size that neck. And when I talk about sizing the neck, that's just uh, this portion up here on the top. So I'm going to size this little area down, just crimp it down a little bit so that bolt will grab onto it. And then after that, so I'll pop this off my dot, off my um, my reloading press. And then this is a full length um, sizing die. This is basically what they call a body die. So everything to your brass is going to be expanding. And you want to be able to get your piece of brass back in your rifle chamber and have a chamber and have you be able to close the bolt. So it's basically just... Um, bumps your shoulder back a little bit. So it allows you to load your ammo in there and close the bolt nicely. So you just have to do this every time too. It's always is doing is like resizing the brass a little bit to making it a little bit smaller. So it fits in your exact chamber. So if I'm tracking you correctly, are there, are there two dies for, for every caliber that you're going to reload? Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You, you, okay. You, there is, there is some dies too, that will do multiple steps at once, but I have figured out over the years that I like to do one thing at a time. So I'm not overworking my brass. Okay. At once, because I don't, I don't want to, you know, I could body size it or full length resize and do the neck sizing at once. But to me, it's like makes a little more sense to do them in individual steps. And that way, too, I can control the process the whole way and make it more precise. Because, like I said, everything I do here is for hunting. And so I need to make sure I get a one shot kill on an animal. Like you do that animal justice, I don't want to miss as well. So I'm just trying to tighten all the tolerances to make these ammo clones of each other. And the third one is just a, uh, this is the one that just seats a bullet. That's all this one does. This one is the last step in the process after I've already sized down the neck. I've dropped the powder. I have a primer in there, obviously. I measured out my, my powder. And then this just seats your bullet in there to a certain, um, what they call cartridge-based O-drive. Big fancy uh, name here. But that's basically the measurement from... This is, this is a dummy round I have loaded. And it basically is the measurement from the bottom 
to this point up here in the bullet, right where it starts to come down. And that way I can know exactly like this bullet is built for my rifle and it's this far off the lands. So it's not, it's not like jamming in the front and it might even, cause you can measure this too, to figure out what you need to do to fit it into your uh, rifle magazine. So one of the biggest tools you're really going to need when you're doing this process, you're seeing the bullet is a digital caliber. This is just a very, you know, there's some cheap ones out there. There's also some expensive ones. I think these are like 160 bucks. So they're pretty okay. expensive. And this just allows you to put your bullet in there or put your whole cartridge in there. And then you just measure whatever distance this is from the base to the ogive, which is right in that bullet area. And that's just a, a, a number that you would figure out before this process starts to help you know exactly that mm-hmm. I'm seeing these perfectly every time. And with that micrometer setting on the top, I could actually adjust this slowly down in like, thousands or ten thousands of an inch to make it so it's perfect okay. so I'll like i'll like see the bullet in there i'll see it a little bit longer and then i'll measure it and then i'll adjust this down a little bit pull it up in the press again and then measure it till i get them exactly clones of each other because again it's just consistency is what i'm looking for okay and you've you've got that initial measurement from your gun that you're kind of working towards right yep i have a tool whoops sorry somewhere right here so this is kind of a little fancy tool that someone would use it's basically a, a round that has been um, drilled in the back to accept this tool. It's based, I don't know if you can see that very well, but mm-hmm. there's no primer in there and it's threaded. So this threads on and then this bullet just free floats in there and I can adjust this here. So it goes in. So you basically stick this into your, uh, the back of your chamber without the bolt. You push this all the way forward and then you push this little lever back here and it's going to seat that bullet. Uh, okay. And then once it stops, that's when you know that's at the lands yeah. of the rifle and that's where it is. And then you tighten this down and then I would okay. pull this tool out and then I would measure this onto here to get that measurement. And then you usually want to go, you know, 10 thousandths underneath that 20 thousandths underneath that. Cause you don't want to jam this bullet up into the rifling one a little bit right. back. So the bullet gets a chance to jump forward. And what's that tool called? Uh, this is the overall length gauge. I think it's okay. made by like Hornady. Okay. And what was the other one you just had? Sorry, uh, I'm so, learning all, all this yep. real this time. Is a, this is a digital caliper with a comparator gauge. And these these are uh, caliper specific. So this one's for a 30 cal. So if you had you know a 6.5, you need to get one that's made for a 6.5, that sort of thing. And what brand do you like with that? This is a Mitato- This is a Mitatoyo. Okay. But you, know, you could go to Home Depot and pick one up. Obviously, this one's just going to be a lot more accurate because it yeah. reads out a lot more decil- decimal places. And like I said, like... You can start out with certain things. And after time, you're like, man, I want to be more accurate. I want to shoot further. I want to, you know, go the distance. I want to practice at a thousand yards to make a 400 yard shot really right. easy. Kind of like kind of shooting a bow. And so you start like getting more expensive tools and then it's figuring out what tools actually work and what tools don't work. So there's oh, a lot. I, I compared uh, long distance shooting to shooting a bow for someone earlier today who was like, I don't really understand all this stuff. I'm like, actually, you kind of do. Cause it's, he, he, I think I was explaining it the inverse, but he's really into shooting. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was talking about archery products. I made the same comparison because there are a lot of similarities um, bet- yeah. between the two. Uh, I, but did we get through all the specifics? Because I've got two more questions, but it's kind of going to move away from the tool side. Was there anything else you wanted to hit and talk through that I didn't mention? I mean, the, the only other big thing too you got to think about is you need a, a powder dispenser. You need something to accurately weigh the powder. And it's going to be hard to see it, but over the far right corner is a big scale. Um, it's a scale with a, with a powder dispenser on top and there's actually a trickle on the side. So that is a uh, very precise, like lab balance scale. It's a, it's one that's probably overkill for most people, but I can basically weigh out one kernel of powder and it'll actually tell me exactly what it is, which is 0.02 grains is, is one kernel. So I can be really p- precise in measuring my powder. So it basically dumps uh, almost all the powder I need. Let's say my, my powder is 77.1 grains. So the powder dispenser is going to dump probably 70, maybe 75 grains at once. And then it starts slowly trickling powder into mm. the little pan. And so it makes it so it's exactly 77.1 grains. I don't want 77.5 because that could be too much pressure. And I don't want it, you know, 76 and a half. I want it exactly 77.1. So powder dispenser is very good. And this one's electronic. I actually can Bluetooth it to my phone. It's a very, very sophisticated piece of gear that... Uh, my wife doesn't know I bought. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else wants to buy one and hide it from their wives or or husbands as well, uh, what what uh, what's the brand of that one? That's an A and D. Uh, what is it? The FX one twenty I. Okay, so there you go. A&D, and then it has an auto trickler system on top of it. This is a guy from Canada who makes it. Adam McDonald 
it's basically the powder dispenser on the top and then this little auto trickle thing on the side. So it's, I don't know how he did it because it's basically a scale. Like it's a regular lab radar scale that you'd use in medical industry or something like that. So it's very, very, I even have windscreens on the side. So like my AC is running, I'll turn my AC off. I'll shut this door to make sure there's no wind. Cause you can literally blow on it and watch mm-hmm. the scale, like go up and down. It's like, it can pick up anything. Oh my gosh. So it's like most people probably use like a charge master or, you know, there's some balance beam scales, but like this one's just, again, like I'm just getting really crazy in this reloading stuff. So I think it's super fun to shoot really long distance. Like I love shooting, you know, out to a mile. Sometimes it might sound crazy like that, but like I can shoot those distances just to make everything else easy. Like we said, the, the archery analogy, it's like practice far, shoot close. That, that's when, a, that's actually a perfect transition in this next question. So I know a lot of people do this for quality and, and I, I'm, I'm always curious, like, is this, and this answer may have changed recently too. Is this just for quality or, or for a hobby, or is there also the possibility of saving money uh, with your rounds when you, when you're reloading? I think there definitely is a way to save money doing this. Obviously there's a big upfront cost to buy some of these tools and some of the tools I'm describing here, like, like that, um, my reloading, uh, scale, for example, that dispenses on my powder. That's really stupid. The little, anne- <laughs> the little annealing device I mentioned to you earlier, like that's also very stupid on your wallet. Like you don't need a lot of that stuff, but like, I'm just trying to pump up more accuracy. So guys who just, just like, you know, they're reloading, they're going on a few hunts a year and they only shoot maybe two, 300 yards. And you just want a very simple setup. I think you totally could save money in the long run, especially when you buy things in bulk. Like I buy bullets in bulk of like 250 bullets at a time. I buy eight pound jugs of powder. So like an eight pound jug of powder could last someone three years, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can save it, but then we start getting all these like finer little tools here and there. And especially now with like people price gouging, like, yeah, like it's, it gets really tough and like trading first children for primers. Exactly. I was thinking about (laughs) trading my kidney for another piece of reloading gear pretty soon. So (laughs) So I think think it is on that, but uh, maybe frowned upon. I don't know. Yeah. So it's like one of those things where, yeah, down the road, like maybe three, four years, like it'll pay for itself. I kind of think of it too. Like, uh, so back in the day I was thinking about getting into, you know, all my own wild game processing. Like you buy it, you mm-hmm. know, a grinder, you buy a bunch of meat bags, you buy a vacuum sealer. Cause I don't want to pay a processor to cut up my meat. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it's a big investment to start, but now I know I've, I fully paid that off. Yeah. And it's like, this just pays off. Like if you That's shoot a good more analogy. Yeah. And the time, like the, mm-hmm. both, both of those take a lot of their own time, but yep. um, also really rewarding when you do get into it, you're making your own, like I, I process, which I'm not, you guys out West are killing way bigger animals than I am. I've got deer, <laughs> but um, you yeah. know, still like, it's super rewarding to be able to do it yourself. And I used to take it to a processor. So that, that analogy really resonates with me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the one thing that doesn't necessarily translate from that analogy is the safety aspect. So if you just get into this, this is my last question. Um, you just get into reloading. What What is a good way to test to make sure you've done this safely, uh, especially in your first few go arounds? Yeah. So the easiest thing to me was literally like, obviously I reloaded with my dad growing up a ton. Like, so I had a good mentor, which made it a lot easier. But for me, like right now, even since I live in Vegas, my dad lives in Minnesota. So like, it's hard to you know bounce ideas. Like I obviously give him a call, but the biggest thing to me is just having a piece of paper and writing down everything you do. Or if you're a guy who wants to be on the computer, like I have a Google doc mm-hmm. that has created everything, everything I do in my, my ammo from how much I resize my brass, how much powder I use, um, step by step, literally my Google doc, if I eventually I'm going to create this in an article because I feel like I should, you know, I've done all this work. I should share it with people, but it's, it's probably 26 to 30 pages long mm-hmm. of step by step. That way I know when I'm going through this process every single time, because I might reload you know, right now shoot a bunch and then maybe I might not reload for a couple of months. I might forget something like forgetting yeah. something. That's when it becomes dangerous. So if you write down everything and it's like a, basically like a checklist, did I do this step? Did I do that step? Did I go through all these little things? And at the end of the thing too, like if you, you know, make sure when, you, when you're doing the powder, you don't, you know, add a bunch more powder. Like the only way to check that is um, just having a scale and sitting right there by there and looking at it and don't grab it set it down like, Oh, did I already put powder in there? I'm just going to, you know, dump it in there. Like you don't just add a little bit of powder here and there. You make sure you do exactly the same steps and just writing it down. And then like, if you get a stump, like, you know, jump on YouTube, search some videos and just figure out what other people are doing. That's going to help them, you know, increase that safety level. Cause these people can explain it really, really well. And it's just uh, keeping records of everything. When you go to the range and shoot, if I all of a sudden shoot a bunch of shots and my bolt becomes really hard to lift because of the pressure getting so, intense in there that my case is actually expanding. 
I need, I know I need to start backing down my uh, powder because it's becoming a little bit unsafe, but that's actually shoot it. But the biggest thing for me is just document everything. Yeah. Like even, 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 expe- even Excel spreadsheets, I have Excel spreadsheets of all the measurements of my brass. Like I measure everything, like all that stuff is going to add up. If you just keep, keep track of everything and keep a checklist going. Yeah. I think that's great advice, man. I think that's great. Um, all right. So the end of the show, where can people find you if they want to follow along with your story and see all this reloading content you're probably sharing? <laughs> yeah, I, I do mainly most of my reloading content on my Instagram. Yeah. I do a lot of like random stories and just kind of that's the easiest way people to probably reach out is just hit me up on Instagram, which is the Brady underscore the letter J and then underscore Miller. All right. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. We'll put a link to all the gear you mentioned. So if anybody's trying to find something, uh, you, you can check it out there. All right, man. Thanks for your time. This has been great. Yeah, uh, hopefully you'll get into reloading and hopefully I didn't complicate it a little bit. No, a I, this was here. an awesome explanation. I I feel like I just 10x my knowledge, which was very minimal, but still just from mm-hmm. a few minutes talking to you here, I now yeah. understand, I think the process at least. And the, the biggest thing too, like maybe a ending note, it's like the more you reload, the more you'll get out and shoot. So you're gonna become yeah. a better shooter because you're going to be reloading so much. Like it makes it fun. Yeah, it's great. It's point. very rewarding. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, man, thank you. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you, Brady Miller. I learned a lot in this episode, as in like magnitudes more than I knew before. So thanks for coming on and sharing that knowledge. All the links that Brady talked about are in the show notes. Make sure you check those out. I want to remind you guys a couple things about Go Wild, who's who's the sponsor of this show. Really, the supporter, the main reason we have a Gearbox Talk. Go Wild is a free social media app that we founded years ago, and just recently we introduced rewards. So today, if you create an account, you're going to get ten bucks to get you started. If you already have an account, you've probably unlocked a butt ton of rewards that you haven't seen. If you haven't been logged in in a while. So definitely go back, log into your account or create an account. As you share content, as you make purchases on Go Wild, we're going to reward you for those. So it's a loyalty program for not only your purchases, but your content. It's a loyalty program probably like you've never seen because I've never seen anything like this before. That's really awesome. But also I wanted to remind you, as you make purchases through us, you know, you buy that Garmin watch or that Vortex scope you've been looking for, we're taking a percent of our proceeds and we're donating that into Raise Them Outdoors. Raise Them Outdoors is this awesome camp that teaches kids to hunt, fish, shoot. The founder, Erin Crooks, is so passionate about what she does, and we are super proud to be one of her leading sponsors. And every time you buy gear through us, you help us put a kid into that camp. It may seem small, but this stuff really adds up. And Go Wild wants to support multiple camps for Raising My Door. So every time you come back and make that purchase, you get to help partner on that with us. So thank you guys for supporting us, for supporting Raising My Doors. Thanks for watching the show. That's all I got today. I'm out. (laughs) 